All right, welcome back to our uh, final section of the cell cycle. So looking at concept 12.3, the eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated by a molecular control system. Now, we're not going to spend uh, any details looking at the exact nature of this molecular control system. We'll just kind of talk at the upper level of how this overall system works, why it's there. So each type of cell within our body has a different frequency of cell division. So we can have um, some cells that never divide. We can have cells that divide occasionally, or we can have cells that are dividing constantly. So our skin cells are dividing constantly, um, creating, regenerating itself. Our blood cells are constantly dividing, but our neurons, pretty much not so much. And the difference here all is due to this molecular control mechanism. This ties in directly with the concept of cancer because cancer cells have developed a way to escape the controls that are limiting its cell cycle. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the sequential series of events that is happening in a cell direct the cell cycle in a clock-like manner. So if we kind of think of this progression of, of G1, S, G2, um, mitotic phase, and then back in the G1, it's kind of a clock that's ticking and spinning around, always in one direction, always moving forward. So that way it's very similar to time. There are both internal and external signals that are controlling this mechanism. Specifically, there are particular checkpoints along this path that will halt the progression through this until certain criteria are met. So you can see that we have um, one in G1. This is important because once we move into the phase where we're duplicating our DNA, we can't really go back, right? So if we get to G1 and we've ramped up a bunch of proteins and we decide, oh no, we don't want to divide, that's fine. Once we get past that though, we have to go through the rest of the cycle. So we have a good checkpoint at G1 to make sure that we have everything we need before replicating our DNA. We also see a checkpoint at the end of G2, and it actually marks a barrier before you can move into mitosis. This is important because you don't want to divide if you haven't replicated your DNA correctly. Remember, G2 is all about checking the DNA, making sure everything was done correctly, and fixing any um, mistakes. We also have a final checkpoint here that will um, halt mitosis and prevent the cells from um, going through the final steps of cytokinesis. All right, so these stop and go signals um, can come from both internal and external um, mechanisms. These three checkpoints that we've talked about, we've largely described them in terms of internal mechanisms that are looking for problems, right? That's how I kind of the, explained it to begin with. So let's stop and think about the external aspects of this. So these external factors that influence um, include things that we call growth factors. So growth factors are one of the signaling molecules that we referred to in chapter 11 that are released by neighboring cells, and it actually stimulates the cell to divide. 
there are um, typically specific growth factors for each different cell type. So for platelets, a type of cell um, that is ultimately derived to help us clot our blood, there is a specific thing called platelet-derived growth factor that um, controls its division. So each cell type largely has its own set of growth factors that it interacts with. And when you do not get these growth factors, you will never even enter into the cell cycle. In addition to that, we also have an internal mechanism called density-dependent inhibition. So when, you, when the cells start crowding around each other, they will actually start to uh, stop dividing. So let's give you an example here. Um, here we're going to take a human connective tissue sample. We'll cut it up into small pieces and um, we'll digest the extracellular matrix, allowing us to separate all these free cells. We'll then put them into culture vesicles. When you do that, and don't add any type of growth factor, nothing happens. Those cells will sit down, they will still live, but they will just sit there. When you start adding in growth factors, you'll see those cells start to divide, and they'll continue dividing until the entire surface of the bottom of this flask is covered. When that happens, all of a sudden, magically, they stop growing. So this is demonstrating the two things we just talked about, that you need a growth factor. So here you get no growth, here you get growth. But also there is a concentration of cells dependency, right? So um, there's an inhibition that kicks in when the cells start to overcrowd themselves. Now, I want you to recognize that in cancer, we could have a, a deviation from either one of these two mechanisms. So you could get growth without growth hormone, or you might stop seeing inhibition when you get a cluster of cells, or you could get both of those mechanisms in play. Now, there's also something that we call anchorage dependent. A lot of times, uh, particular cell types will not allow cells to grow unless there is a particular extracellular matrix that they can bind to. So here we have um, So here we have three different mechanisms of how cells are somewhat controlled from going into the cell cycle. So again, we talked about the idea of um, growth factors are necessary. We talked about the idea that when cells are too clustered, they get inhibited. inhibited. Um, but we also now have this anchorage mechanism. So if there isn't an extracellular matrix, to attach to, the cells won't grow. All three of these mechanisms are working together to kind of create the optimal density of cells for that tissue type. Now, as I said, cancer cells can have deviations that manipulate any one of those above scenarios. So when we lose, start to lose some of these controls is how we develop cancer. So a cancer isn't derived from a single mutation. It's actually a series of mutations where we've lost different layers of control. So some of the things that they can do to get around not needing growth factors. They could be making their own growth factors. Um, 
they may continue to signal the same signaling cascade that the growth factor would stimulate without the presence of the growth factor. You could have a mutation in the cell cycle control mechanism. So you can see that there are a lot of different places where a mutation could impact this first ability. Now, when we talk about the process of a normal cell becoming a cancerous cell, we call that a transformation. Most cancer cells or precancerous cells are eliminated almost immediately by our immune system. We see them form, we treat them as a foreign object, and we destroy them. But those that do not get eliminated will start to form these masses called tumors. So a tumor is just simply a mass of abnormal cells within otherwise normal tissue. If all of those cells remain in the same spot, we call that a benign tumor, right? So what that means is since they're all in the same spot, they, while this tumor could continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger if you don't remove it, once you remove it, there's no problem because the cells are all in this one area. The biggest problem with cancer is it can progress to the point where it being limited to a certain extracellular matrix to grow is somehow lost. And this is what we refer to as malignant tumors. So this is uh, tumors that begin invading the surrounding tissue. Ultimately, these malignant tumors can metastasize and move into other parts of the body. Now, localized tumors can be treated with high energy radiation, which damages their DNA and causes the cancer cell to die. Uh, this radiation um, highly impacts cells that are dividing rapidly, but cells that are dividing slowly are not as impacted. Those cells have time to repair themselves. Um, some uh, forms of chemotherapies um, are also targeting the control mechanism, mechanism of the cell cycle directly. So to kind of put all these different ideas together here, we have the idea of a single mutation happening, which is allowing a cell to start growing or uh, replicating when it shouldn't. That grows into what we call a tumor. But provided that it stays in one spot, thinking that it is a particular cell type, usually that's a very easily interventable uh, problem where we can just simply remove it. A second step of progression is when those cells start invading into other tissues. Ultimately, that invasion can include those cells being released into either the blood vessels, which can distribute throughout the entire body, or this parallel system called the lymphatic system, which uh, has tubes that can pass all throughout the body. This can mean that those cells can end up in different locations and start growing into tumors there as well. This is a much bigger problem to treat. So concept 12.3, uh, your carotid cell cycle is regulated by a molecular control system. We didn't talk about what that control system is, but we did talk about it on why it works, right? So we have this a series of things. We know replicating DNA uh, is kind of a, a go or no go type of scenario. So if we start, we can't stop. So we have a checkpoint right before that. Also, if we have a mistake, we can't uh, separate the cells into two. So we have a checkpoint there. And then we also have one final checkpoint before the cells divide. We talked about how cells require um, external signals to grow. We talked about how density and location matter, and we talked about cancer progression.